Now here's the interface specification I mentioned before. When you build a simulation system, you usually end up with some kind of military model that describes a submarine or an aircraft or something. You also end up with a lot of simulation tools which you're using. And you usually inter, inter, end up with interfaces connecting you to external systems. Sometimes C4I devices, sometimes real world, world training ranges, all different kinds of things. Well, when you inter exchange information from that device with something else out in the real world, you're going to make a call into one of those services that I that specified in the HLA interface specification. The software that makes that call mean something is called the runtime infrastructure. The runtime infrastructure is a package of software which instantiates the interface specification. And so when you link together all of the code that is your military model or that is your simulation tool, you link in the code you wrote and the RTI code into one executable. And it's doing things for you that you didn't understand how it's, it's being done. Now, if you build any complex application, you're probably linking in somebody's library for graphics, somebody's library for, for uh, database access, somebody's library for network operations. You're already doing this. It's just that the RTI is the package that helps you do simulation interoperability. The object model templates. This is a snapshot of some of those templates and they're essentially allowing you to express information about the objects you're going to publish, about the events you're going to publish, about the attributes about each object that you're going to share, and about the class structure of the objects, letting the world know that an F-16 is a member of a class called jet, which is a member of a class called aircraft, which is a member of a class called vehicle, for example, so that you know what an F-16 is in the larger sense. Well, that was HLA in a nutshell. I told you, we go through it really quick. <clears throat> we can give you one hour worth on a HLA. That would be the second day of the three-day class. Or we can give you three solid days worth. It depends on which class you want to sign up for. But that was it in a nutshell. The next one is Cedrus. I mentioned that in order to have two simulators fight together on the same battlefield, you've got to load them up with the same environmental data. It's very easy for the simulator on this side to load up some data that doesn't match the simulator on this side. And for those two to try and interact with each other, and for one simulator to find out that he has a hill in front of him where the other guy finds he has a valley. And you look there and this guy looks and he says, I see a hill, I don't know that there's another tank behind it. But this guy on the other side of the hill, it's like looking at a one-way mirror, he says, no, there's a valley right there, I see you and I shoot you. It's also possible for there to be, you know, for, to have buildings in, the different, in different places, to have um, the representations of trees to be at different densities. Or in some cases, you'll put out a forest full of trees where you plant individual trees and you can see a tank between the trees. In other cases, you create a forest by putting in like a movie backdrop and it's a solid board painted with trees on it and you can't see anything between the trees. So when those two simulators come to fight together, one guy will be shooting between the trees and the other guy will say, I don't see anything but trees. Cedrus is trying to address that issue and it's a very, very complex issue. The, d the terrain data is so specific and it gets so customized for each hardware device that it's really difficult to create one master copy of the terrain database and say, here's the copy that everyone will use. Not only is that difficult, it's impossible. And Cedrus doesn't try to do that. Instead, what they try to do is create a lingua franca, a common language into which all terrain databases can be translated and from which any one of those terrain databases can be translated back out. So you would ideally build a master copy of the terrain of North Korea in a Cedrus format totally populated in Cedrus, and then when you need to instantiate it on three different simulation systems, different graphics devices, you would translate out of that common master copy into version A, version B, and version C. That guarantees that they will be more likely to match. It doesn't guarantee that they'll be identical, but it is a big step towards getting these things to look the same and behave the same. Now, if you're going to have this master copy of the database, there's three characteristics that are very important for that master copy. 
Number one, it has to have a complete capture of the data in all the database formats. If you're going to be one of the importers, the CEDRUS database is not allowed to say, oh, that little feature, we don't think that's important, we didn't include it, throw it out. It has to be able to capture any feature you push into it and hold it for you. Second, it has to have lossless data translation. When you translate into that format, you can't have the equivalent of rounding error. You can't throw out some polygons and say nobody needs that many polygons in a tree. You have to be able to hold it. The person taking it out gets to decide whether they want that many polygons in the tree or not. The Cedrus format has to hold all of it. And then set third is the unambiguous representation of data. The hill versus valley example is a good example. If I just define four terrain post uh, locations for you, when you go to connect those four posts together, you can do the box around the edge really easily. But then when you try to decide whether the two high posts are the corners of a ridge or whether they're the outside edges of a valley, there's not enough information there to make that decision. You've got to store more than just the locations of those four points so you'll know whether that's a hill or a valley. That's part of the unambiguous representation. So Cedrus has to be able to tell you that's supposed to be a hill or that's supposed to be a valley. Now I think I'm going to say, and that was Cedrus in a nutshell. It's a small nutshell. Uh, the reason we do interoperability so quickly in a one-day course is because there are so many other dedicated courses to the subject. And if you really need to know that and much information about it, you need to take a different course than this one or in addition to this one. Now, we, we simulation people, or DOD in general, we get our simulations running together and the first thing we do is start expanding the definition of interoperability. We're not happy with just having our simulation systems talk to each other. Now we want them to talk to the C4I universe. The C4I universe is a whole bunch of very different computer systems that are used to do command and control. They sometimes display maps. Sometimes they just format messages. Sometimes they parse messages and bring them in and put, send them to a printer. There are all kinds of C4I devices. And now we want our simulations to be able to send data to our C4I systems. <clears throat> well, if the C4I systems do not use some kind of standard modeling framework, some standard representation of their data, then the problem of connecting a simulation to a C4I system is a unique interface problem. Even though we in the simulation community may have a standard like HLA, if they don't have something like that in the C4I world, every interface is custom built. So you can build a custom interface to JDIS, a custom interface to GCCS, a custom interface to ACES, a custom interface to, and just keep naming the systems. That's exactly what we in the simulation community are trying to get away from with, this, with the high level architecture and DIS and ALSP. The C4I community, if we're to make a generic interface to them, they're going to have to do the same thing. And they're working on it. And when they get it, then we'll just build a bridge that translates from our universal representation to their universal representation and push information through it. And it'll end up at whatever the system is without having to custom build software that speaks to ACES particularly. So that's where we're headed. Uh, in the future, where is this going? One of the things that I've seen on a couple of programs is the tip of the iceberg of a new idea. We started out specifying that we would achieve interoperability by generating these network packets, the DIS protocols and the ALSP protocols. Then we went up to a higher level where we said, no, we're going to create a service-based infrastructure. And we're going to provide you with the same software services. In the military domain, I think it's possible to move the level of, in, of reusability higher and to specify a set of base classes or base objects and base interactions that are going to be common among all simulation systems that are doing combat simulation. So in the future, you're going to, I think you'll see the water level of reusability and of, of common infrastructure software go higher. And there's some ideas about doing that in, with what's called modeling frameworks. Now, is that, how is that going to work out? Ask me again in five years and maybe we'll know more. But right now we don't know. 
The other thing that you're going to see is computers that weren't meant to be part of the simulation system trying to jump in and join a simulation. Well, what do I mean by that? Your web browser, for example. You're going to find people who want to walk up to any computer on the planet, bring up their web browser, go to a certain URL, and have the information about a simulation that's running right now downloaded right to that window. And we talked about this, this VRML representation in order to bring a virtual environment, the terrain, the sky, the weather, into your web browser where none of that information existed before. That's another kind of interoperability that, or an extension to interoperability that's emerging right now. And I already mentioned connecting to non-simulation systems. Well, that's, that's what we're going to talk about on interoperability. Is there any other questions on <laughs> this subject? Use the uh, abbreviation PDU. What does that stand for? Protocol Data Unit. It's a network message packet. It's the generic name for the DIS network packages. They're called Protocol Data Units. And if you want to learn a lot more about DIS, you can go to www.sisostds.org. And that stands for CISO standards there in the middle. And you'll find uh, a lot of information about the DIS protocols, and they're, they're gathering more and more about HLA there as well. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? How about I'll write it down for you later. OK. Excellent reference on HLA. The website I just gave you is, is invaluable. If you want to know about HLA and DIS and some about ALSP, the CISO website absolutely essential. But here's a brand new book that just came out. It's written by a couple of authors at MIT and one at DMSO, and it describes the high-level architecture. Just came out a few months ago, and as you can see, I'm on about page 150 of it right now. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good explanation of how HLA works. And if you want to know more about this, you might get this book. A second reference on the internet, if you go to the web-based technical reference on simulation and interoperability, the URL is provided there. Uh, you'll find HTML pages which give a good overview of simulation interoperability as well. That's the sum of interoperability from SimNet to DIS to HLA, ALSP, CEDRUS, and C4I systems. Uh, that's interoperability as we see it today.